It is my pleasure to introduce Mete Tunka, Associate Director of Research Systems and Services in Brown Center for Computation and Visualization, who's going to talk to us about options for research data systems. So Mete, please take it away. Thank you, Dr. Ritt. Okay, I'm gonna just jump right into it. Um, okay, so I've got really two agenda items uh, for today. One, to talk about you know, what options do you have for research data? And I really wanna just take it through uh, from, you know, beginning to end, uh, start with re risk levels. Um, that's really where we start when we talk, when we start talking about research data, the pricing, some central storage options you have, some compute options you have, um, where we are with the cloud in terms of research. And I want to give an overview of the Carney condo as well. So when I think research data, where we start typically at CCV is we look at the risk level. And that's really, in my mind, determines everything in terms of where that data should go where the, and how it should be computed on. So what does risk level mean? Risk level means that if the data is compromised, if the confidentiality is, is compromised, what's the impact at that point in time? Because once you understand what the impact is, you can then determine what level of security should be placed on securing that data. So that's where we wanna start. We wanna find out what level of, you know, how bad is it gonna hurt if something bad happens to that data? And so we really classify it in three levels, one, two, and three. So um, I'll, I'm gonna click on the link at the bottom and, uh, and show you a lot more detail because Mark Dietrich, our CISO, would be uh, mortified if he felt I was representing this in three 30-second bullets. But I'll start with that for now and then, and then dive a little deeper just for a minute. Um, so level one is it's probably publicly consumable information. If we compromise the confidentiality of that data, the, the risk to Brown is probably minimal uh, financially and otherwise. Level two is sensitive data in some regard. It's not generally available. There is some sensitivity to it. And if we compromise the confidentiality of it, there will be some risk to Brown reputation financially and otherwise. And level three, really means that the data requires protection by some law or some regulation and any sort of breach, any sort of confidentiality uh, compromise is gonna be significant. It's gonna impact Brown's mission. It's gonna impact Brown's reputation. There, there's gonna be consequences. I'm gonna just quickly, again, I don't wanna spend too much time on it, but I feel like it's worth kind of introducing to the mindset from our side when we start talking about data and where, where it should reside. So this is the three, risk levels kind of tells you a little bit about a um, little more detail than what I did. <clears throat> but I want to jump to this part of it, which gives you a little more. Level three is, is protected health information. It's PII uh, that will impact, you know, somebody's life fairly significantly. If it's compromised, that's the PII. The PHI is non-negotiable. That's level three for sure. Um, if you move on to level two, it de-identified uh, PHI. So it's identifiable data, it's identifiable health data that was de-identified, not anonymized, but de-identified. Um, or it's a limited data set, or it's again PII, but it's 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 more in a research space, so um, a little less impact. And then level one is you know completely de-identified research data, um, anonymous data, and so on. So I don't want to go too much into that, but that that that's the that's the uh, association, that's the definition of risk uh, from our perspective. And then again, there are security requirements that go along with each risk. And before I jump into what are those storage options for the different risk, what are the compute options for each risk, um, I did want to spend just a brief moment on on some of the the benefits that that, that exist in terms of storage and pricing. Um, all Brown faculty get one terabyte of free data just by being nature uh, of being a faculty member. And that goes across the storage options, by the way, that that's in total. So if you count how much you have data in LRS, Isilon, R data, Stronghold, the totality of that for one terabyte is free. And all the storage options I just mentioned, I'll go into in a minute anyway. Um, and also on top of that, if you have a grant, a Brown active grant, then you get 10 terabytes again in total across all those different storage options. So if you're a PI that has 
five grants, you have 51 terabytes of data for free. So let's talk central storage for a moment, then we'll get into uh, compute. So on the storage side, we've got a number of options. We've got our campus file storage, um, and we've got two of them. We've got the LRS, we've got uh, which is locally redundant storage, and we've got Isilon. They're, they're both level two risk, so you can store level two data there. The LRS is $50 per terabyte per year. The Isilon is $100 per terabyte per year. Neither are really intended for very intensive high throughput, um, but they are accessible from the VPN, the Brown campus and so forth. And again, they are risk level two. Um, the difference is uh, from replicated, non-replicated is Isilon is replicated to a DR facility that's different from the data center. Um, but I do want to clarify that the durability, reliability is still good on LRS. I mean, there are still multiple copies in the Providence data center. Uh, it's still very durable. We're talking 99.69s versus 99.129s on Isilon. So if replication is important, Isilon is definitely what, you know, what makes sense. But if replication is not important, I don't want to misrepresent LRS because it is still highly reliable. There are still multiple copies. It is still very resilient. It's just, it's not replicated to a DR site. Okay, I threw Google in here. Uh, I don't, I'm not planning on spending a lot of time on it because I feel like it's, it's a, it's a well-known commodity that um, for better or for worse people use, but that's rated risk level two. And I'm happy to answer any questions you may have on it, but I'm gonna move on to some of the other, service, other storage that we have. Right, so um, we've got our data center in Providence and if that data center, you know, really just becomes, you know, some sort of disaster, um, natural disaster or otherwise, and we essentially lose everything there, the data is physically replicated to another site. So we do, while we may not have the compute on, at, the, at the other side, we do have the data. So we have another location that if the first location goes up and, you know, goes up in the air, um, the, the second site is there available for us to get the data. Okay, so we've got our, our Oscar data, our R data on our HPC uh, system. Um, it's a high performance uh, data storage system. It's directly connected again to our high performance computing cluster in Oscar. Um, we've got, that's rated for risk level two. It's $100 per terabyte per year. We've got Stronghold. That's our uh, risk level three, highly uh, secure and compute uh, storage environment. Um, Again, this is where you would put your PHI, your PII, and so forth. That's $100 per terabyte per year. It can only be accessed by compute uh, by the Stronghold compute server. So it's it's a it's an enclave. It's a, it's a highly secure enclave. And then this is probably what I'm most excited to share with you today is our new archiving service. I feel like we've talked about archiving at Brown, um, you know, for a while now, and uh, this is. It's kind of cool to be able to introduce it. Um, it's in pilot phase right now, so I'll, I don't think I'm supposed to talk about it too, too much until it's publicly available, but um, here, here's what I can tell you about it. It leverages Starfish. I'm not sure if folks have used Starfish before, but it, it's, a, it's a pretty cool interface. It's pretty simple, it's pretty easy to use, and it's pretty intuitive. The data would be archived for 10 years, um, you can, and the, the PI can essentially run it themselves. They can go in, they can archive, they can delete, they can recover the data. And what I find actually pretty cool about it is you have context for the data. So it's not just when you archive something, it, it's not gone, so to speak. You can still see it within the structure, within the data structure, you just see that it's it's archived. So you you have a sense of, you have, a, you have a relationship of, you know, where the data was and, and, and what it was, but it's still archived. Um, but, you know, we have an entire video on this that I'm happy to share with you if you'd like to, uh, uh, to learn more about it. Um, the pricing model, I'm not sure if that's public yet, in truth, again, because we're in pilot uh, phase, but I will say to you, I have seen it, I've seen different variations of it, and the intent is set so that it is an archiving service. So they, they've set it in such a way that if you use Hibernate as an archive, then it's going to really have a minimal cost to you um, because you're going to archive it and you're going to really forget about it or, or re recover it 
very, very minimally. But if so, if someone were to use it in more than that to try and use it as swing pace or swing swing space and or get the data back frequently, then I think it'll be costly. And I think that was that that was set up that way um, for that reason. I'm not familiar with that in truth, but I can give you a little more detail about how this is going to work. Basically, it's an interface um, that you'll have access to. You'll see all your all your zones. Zone is essentially all the data sources that you have. So you've got LRS, you've got um, Isilon, you've got um, Oscar storage, the R data. So you'll see all your zones. You'll see the directories and you know everything that you would as if you were on those systems. And then you'll, from what I recall, you'll right click and you'll have three options. I wanna recover this, I want to archive this, or I wanna delete this. Now deleting is not a archive service, but it may be, we, we thought this interface was so nice to be honest that, hey, you know, it's one-stop shopping. When you're there, if you see something that you don't need, tag it for delete. And then I believe the way that it's gonna work is we will have some sort of job that runs at some frequency. I don't know if it's nightly, weekly or whatever it is, but some job will run at some frequency and it'll basically execute those tags on a, you know, on a regular basis. And, I, in truth, I don't think the recovery was set necessarily because of of anything other than we just don't want to, you know, perpetually start moving things back and forth. And I think, you know, with the with the number of people that would be using the service, and um, and if it was to be used as swing space, it would become unwieldy. So I think I think it's more they wanted to just make sure that this is truly utilized as an archive service. Okay. And just for con just for completeness, I want to offer the other side of the of the coin, which is okay. What do we have for compute? We've got our high performance computing cluster that a lot of people on this call I know are familiar with. That's risk level two. We've got free exploratory accounts, and we've got some paid accounts that are available. Um, our paid accounts, I think, are substantially more now than they were probably two years ago. We've got a, a great variety of of paid accounts, um, especially on the GPU side. We've grown quite substantially with our, our GPU offerings. We've got, uh, that's level two. Our level three is Stronghold. Again, it, it's, it's basically each PI get their own tenant, which is a self-contained storage and compute environment. Um, and that's related level three. And then VM provisioning, which I'm not sure how many people know about this service. I don't think we necessarily do a great job of advertising this, but if you wanted your own VM, you know, for whatever reason, you've got some testing you wanna do on your own, whatever it might be, we can provision you your own VM. We can make it risk level one or two, but and you'll have administrative privileges on that VM. And if you, uh, you know, if you were to click on this, it'll take you to the form. You fill out the form and it asks you a series of questions. You know, where, what, where on the network do you want? How much compute and storage do you want? Uh, there are no GPUs available on this uh, for this service, but uh, you know, just a something better than your laptop that you wanted to to uh, try some things on. This is a service that we offer. Uh, up to 256 gig of block storage. I think if you ask for Ubuntu, I don't think they would turn you down, but I think by default it's uh, really, like I said, it, it, it's, the, 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 it's not crazy resources, but it, it's not bad either. And it's, it's good for some of that local work. Okay. Uh, I wanted to briefly cover the cloud as well. Um, so the Office of Information Technology, where I'm from, we're working with Burwood, and Burwood is a, a GCP reseller. And essentially, you know, everybody knows they can go get their own GCP resources. I'm sure a lot of you have. Uh, but if you work with Burwood, you know, with, through us, uh, it's a 5% discount. Burwood has, um, we've actually been working with different researchers who have had their own GCP accounts, a GCP uh, projects and so forth, and we've uh, working with them and moving them under the the Burwood umbrella to take advantage of the of the discount. So it's a five percent discount uh, working with Burwood. We've been working with Burwood, I think, for a couple of years now. <clears throat> now I'm not sure if everybody knows about the Strides Initiative. I'll let you read the words of the acronym. Um, but basically, it's an NIH uh, program, and all cloud providers have a Strides rate. And uh, the the key requirement, though, is your research effort has to be an NIH uh, grant funded effort. So if it's if it's NIH funded, then you do quali you you would qualify for the strides rate. We're actually working with Burwood as the facilitator for GCP and AWS. 
And my understanding is it's up to a, it's up to a 25% discount compared to, you know, a researcher going on their own. Okay, I want to spend uh, a couple of minutes on the Carney node. Um, and I'm sorry, the Carney condo rather, and I'm not sure how many people know about what our condo model is. And I want to just kind of cover that a little bit. Uh, so the Carney Institute for Brain Science, um, you know, purchased some equipment and we added it to our HPC cluster as a condo, which is short for condominium. Um, the principal investigator for the Carney condo is Dr. Sains. Um, and I wanted to take a couple of minutes to talk what a condo is, what a condo definition is, because the Carney condo is not the only condo we have uh, in our Oscar cluster. We have, in truth, uh, a fair amount of condos. Um, different researchers have purchased hardware and brought their own condos into our cluster. So the hardware is purchased, but it's not for exclusive use. Um, it is placed in our general pool of nodes. So it's part of our HPC cluster. However, there are a lot of benefits that come with this by having that non-exclusive use. One, from a, from a user perspective, you still have the highest priority access. The condo, uh, whoever's in that particular condo, the quality of service associated with that condo is such that your job, as long when those resources become available, is the next job that's going to run. It's going to run above an exploratory account. It's going to run above any other priority account that exists on the system. So the condo priority is the highest priority. And the quality of service that you're going to get is going to be 1.25 times um, the number of CPU cores purchased. So I believe Carney purchased 1,024 CPU cores, um, but you'll see in the next slide that the cores available total is uh, 1,280. And that, that's where the 1.25 comes in. Um, and also what you get is you get, you know, my team and, and other teams supporting. We've got, you know, we really kind of, uh, our, our shop is really a full service shop. We do all the infrastructure management. We do all the administration, all the dedicated support. So, um, you know, you buy the equipment and really uh, our teams uh, support it. I want to talk about a little bit about the, uh, the Carney condo from a technical perspective. I won't go into all of it. I, I'll let you, uh, you know, read in or ask any questions, but uh, it's, we bought, essentially 32 uh, Cascade Lake nodes. The total QoS quality of service is uh, 1,280 cores, uh, 12 terabytes of memory. Um, we've also got 10 NVIDIA Quadro RTX 6000 GPU nodes, uh, 10 GPUs per node for a total of 100 GPUs, um, along with the, the CPU cores and the, and the memory you see there. We've got uh, 1.4 petabytes of data storage. That's part of the Carney condo. And what that means, and there's there's 48 sub condos for different research groups. I know there's there are folks on this call um, that have a uh, a sub condo um, on the uh, on the Carney condo, um, and each group gets 25 terabytes of storage. That was recently increased from 20, um, by the way. Um, and you'll see the limits on an individual basis down below. I mean the 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 uh, the CPU cores. Um, the GPUs are 75 GPUs. No, in truth, no one's going to request 75 GPUs on a single job. I think the max what we've seen is, is 10, which is the limit on a, on a per node basis. But anyway, that is the QoS that is currently set. Uh, so that's my, my email address. Um, I have a, a great team, uh, the research tech services team. And if you email them at support at CCV, um, a ticket gets created. And we try and respond uh, as quickly as we can to the ticket, especially if it's uh, you know just a question about utilization or or access or so forth. 